everybody. Longest title in the world. You forgot the last bit, Maggie, which was on what we can do to change that, which is important because it's not all negative, I promise. Um, but I guess the purpose of this session today um, is to go through uh, a couple of things around the industry that we all work in. Um, particularly from my perspective, it's a bit of a frank assessment of the digital landscape in the employee benefit and reward arena. Um, I've been in that space now for about 15 years, so I've seen a lot of different technologies, been part of a lot of different technology solutions, and um, I think if some of my competitors are in the room today, they may not like everything I have to say, but uh, hopefully you guys can sort of interpret it the way you need to. And, and also I think it's upon us to, to make a change in the future. Um, so look, we're going to cover off uh, the digital world our people live in, so starting a little bit in terms of the people perspective, the consumers that we have uh, dealing with technology every day in their lives and just what that looks like and what that means today. Translating that into the working world of technology and, and being, again, quite frank about some of the faults with the way that we design technology and why it's not changing maybe fast enough in this particular space. But that there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Whoa, too fast. Uh, there is a better way of thinking um, and that actually there may be basically be some green shoots that we can see in the way that we're developing technology today for this particular industry and hopefully then a view as to what the impact will be, um, particularly affecting all of your lives uh, in your roles today. So we're just going to start off, um, I'm, I'm sure somebody else will use this today, I've stolen it from somebody, it keeps getting stolen, so I'll, but I'll use it in case you haven't seen it. Uh, we've all heard the phrase, the attention span of a goldfish, it's nine seconds for those of you who didn't know. Um, in 2018, the human is down to eight seconds and that's decreased from 12 seconds in 2008. Um, I, was quite, I was quite astonished by that. Eight seconds is our attention span today. And then when you play it through, you start to realize why that might be. And it's the wall of noise that we get in our lives around technology in particular. Um, I don't need to go through logos and things like this. All you have to do is get out your phone and see how many apps. Some of you will have them nicely organized into little folders. Some of them will be spread out across multiple pages. Everyone's different, everyone interprets that way, and sometimes it's very easy to navigate the things you want. But how many apps on that phone of yours or your iPad or wherever it might be are largely ignored because you downloaded it once, thought it might be useful, and then at some point you'll clean it up again in, in the future. Every, um, every second, 300 hours of material is uploaded to YouTube. Every second. 300 hours. Just try and interpret that for a moment and just think about how much content is entering our lives at any stage. Getting people's attention in eight seconds is really difficult. And for as long as that slide's been up, a whole year's worth of content has been put onto YouTube. That's just YouTube. It's, it's an incredible amount for us to interpret as human beings, particularly when we're being pushed all the time. But when you look at the business landscape of technology, it's actually not much better. That's our private lives, that's the applications that we use. But if we start and look at three layers that all of you will be reasonably familiar with, and certainly this is kind of a little bit of insight into my world in terms of technology that I have to deal with in the workplace. To start with, I've got business applications I have to deal with. So I've got my CRM system to manage my relationships with you guys. I've got a SharePoint where a load of information is dumped and hopefully looked at at some point in the future. I've got an intranet, time recording systems, collaboration tools, maybe some social tools creeping in there. I've got to make sure invoices are sent to my clients. I've got sales management pipelines to manage. There's a whole range of stuff. And that's before we get to the fact that I've got PowerPoint and LinkedIn and my Word documents and my Excel spreadsheets that I have to manage. There's a lot of stuff that we have to deal with just to operate our businesses today. And you'll all be familiar with this with all of these systems. Take that down into HR territory, and you've got a whole layer of other systems that we all have to use. The HRIS system, so you're your HR platforms where you maybe update time and attendance, you've got payroll platforms, uh, recruitment software that you've bought in last year, training and development, holiday system is different to the time and attendance system. I don't know, you've, you've all got different, um, different circumstances in your business. And then you've got the general everyday HR management software that might sit within there uh, as well. Oh, too far. And then lastly, um, you've got the reward and benefit landscape. So what most of us are here today to do from a professional point of view. You've got a benefit management system, or a flex system as you may call it. You've got a perk and discount website. You've got the healthcare has got an app and a provider website that you can go to. The pension provider's got the same. Um, you've got a total reward site that's different to your benefit management site. You've got a share save program with one of the share save providers. 
you've got a claims platform that people have to go through to claim their dental, and you've got a medical platform they have to go claim their medical. And on top of that, there is this massive, massive growing ecosystem of wellness solutions that are in the market. Whether you look at that through the physical lens, the financial lens, the social lens, the mental lens, a lot of them here today, there is a lot fine for our people's attention. And my view on this is, is quite simple. What happens when you do this is the first thing that happens is your employees get confused. They don't know where to go. Gethin was just talking a little bit about this a minute ago, if you were in this room. They have confusion to start with because they don't know where to go for information. They get frustrated because they don't know where to find the information that's needed at that point in time. They, I, I have this all the time. I don't know where to go for certain pieces of information. It's really difficult to do. But the first problem is it leads to this zone. It leads to indifference. That's the place that we get most employees to with platforms. And do you know what happens when indifference kicks in? Indifference means I turn off. I don't bother. And that's a big issue for us because it leads to some fundamental issues in the way that we operate our businesses and the way that we're trying to engage people. What does that mean? Well, let's look at business performance first. Business performance, if you're asking people to look at lots of different systems and try to upload data in, means that the reporting is only actually as useful as the data input. If you've reached a different stage with your people, I can guarantee you that the input that's going in is next to useless, if, if it's going in at all. I have this issue around CRM platforms within, within our workplace. Trying to get people to engage with the platform in itself is difficult. If they get to indifference level, they're not inputting anything. The data I get out is next to useless. If you look at that from an HR reward perspective, it means that it remains an administrative function. It means you're chasing people constantly to do basic fundamental tasks around their, the HR practices within the organization. So you're, again, you're not engaging them in something that's easy and frictionless. You're getting them to that indifferent point where they're just not turning on to the, the program. And what it means is you employ a load more people to deal, particularly with senior people who just can't be bothered, to deal with their admin queries that they've got. And of course, with well-being being the next sort of frontier of reward and benefits, there's all of these big claims about the return on investment that you can get by putting lots of different well-being products in front of, uh, of your people. But if there's too many, and if you're creating more of a wall of noise for those individuals, you get to a different stage again. You get to a different stage, there's no way the, the educational platform that you're putting in around finance is going to is going to get anybody onto it to actually be educated. There's no way that the mental health approach that you're trying to take is going to, to kick off if people don't know where to find the information that's there. It is a real challenge. And there's a reason for that, which is the way that this industry has designed technology over the last 15 to 20 years. Um, and I, I can say it with a reasonable degree of confidence because I've been involved in a lot of it as well. And, and to a certain extent, things need to change. And so I'm here today to turn and say, let's take ownership of that. So how do we normally design technology? There's a kind of five-step process that generally happens. The first is the idea itself. So is there a market need? Somebody like me has spotted something in the market and gone, actually, we can fix this. We could create something really excellent that's going to solve the problem. So take back to benefit administration of Flex. Uh, platforms, this happened about 20, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, where somebody saw the amount of paperwork and spreadsheets that were managed and thought, we can do this better using technology. And the dot-com bust had just happened. Let's leverage that and move forward. So ideas are important. The next really important question that tends to happen is, is there a client need? Which fundamentally means, will you guys buy it? Will it sell? Can somebody turn up and showcase you a platform, get you hooked in, the, in your attention, and therefore you'll pay good money from your organization to actually, uh, to actually buy the technology itself. So those are the first two steps. The third thing, quite obviously, is can, um, can I make money? Um, a lot of the companies here today, a lot of, a lot of the companies uh, in this space, of course, are privately owned. They've got certain trajectories, so you know, they have to make money. So there's no point building it if there's not going to be a return on investment in terms of moving that forward. And at that stage, then you go, right, we've got the idea, we think it will sell, we think we can make some money for it, but let's focus on the features and functions. And then lastly, we'll, look, we'll just focus a bit at the end to make sure it looks okay, it's sort of modern enough, and people will engage with it, we hope. And this is where things need to change, because we're missing a big part of the picture. You can't get away from the fact there needs to be a market need. There needs to be something there that drives and generates an idea. So I'm not going to start reinterpreting the whole cycle absolutely needs to happen. But the next step 
that has to happen and the design process is very different. It's human first. And what does human first means? mean? It means, is it playful, is it fun, and is it useful? Because if it's not those three things, it's not going to engage the individual in using it. If it's clunky, if it's cumbersome, if there's no reason to go back to it on a regular basis, then it needs to be there. Client need, I think that still exists. There needs to be a need for it from your perspective. You need to think that it's going to tick that box. There is, does need to be a bigger focus on the UX, the user experience, but that's not necessarily just the look and feel. It's how easy it is to engage with it. It's how connected these technologies sit behind the scenes. Because if they're not connected, if they're not drawing through information, again, you're just going to have to be signposted to another system to log in again. A great example of that that's been achieved in the, in the finance space in the recent years is open banking. The fact that we can now aggregate information through into one place is a great example where actually the look and feel doesn't matter as much as the fact that connectivity behind the scenes is there so that information is instantly, frictionlessly available to your people at the end of it. And then lastly, the bit that normally gets a lot of attention, you can start to focus on what the features and functions are. Doing that slowly in iterative steps, getting it out there, what can it do? That's important as well. And this is a change that hasn't happened with most of the technology in this space yet. I'm just going to focus on what playful, fun, and useful means. All of you will be familiar with the logos on there. In fact, I dare say a huge number of you in the room have... Um, have one of those applications on their phone, if not probably at least half of the applications on their phone. Uh, yes, there's a lot of social tools in there. Yes, there's banking tools. But even right down at kind of school level, bottom left-hand corner is Mathletics. I don't know if anybody's familiar with it. It's an application that my, um, my daughter uses on an iPad at the weekends to do her maths homework. It's addictive. It's fun. It's engaging. And all she wants to do is beat her classmates to the top of the leaderboard all weekend long. She suddenly got good at maths this year because the technology is so good that it makes her want to go back into it at the weekend. I'm addicted to things like Zwift and Strava because I love cycling. And that gets me addicted because people give me kudos and likes for going out and exercising. What a great feeling because I get these nice dopamine hits that happen every time I go for a bike ride. And so it makes me want to go for another bike ride and another bike ride and another bike ride. Um, your people are all using technology to communicate with each other in the workplace. How many of your people have got their secret work WhatsApp groups going on? Right? Um, I don't care what your policy is. They're doing it. And trust me, I've got about three within the workplace that I've got going on right now. They're, they're buzzing away in my pocket as I speak. These are all happening. These are playful, fun, and useful. And if you can achieve that, there is a lot more that can be achieved in this industry, but we're not doing that yet. And that's, that's the part that needs to change. Who's ready for some bad PowerPoint animation? Good. Ready? There you go. Um, what is the solution? Today we are not, um, we're not embracing a lot of these things that actually can, uh, can change the way we work and, and develop technology. There's a couple of things that... Um, that I like to focus on at the moment, a couple of things that we're working on within Mercer, certainly, that, that we think will, will be relatively game-changing in this space in a short space of time. The one thing that's not really been achieved yet is social. Yet, the vast majority of applications that are in your pocket, on your phone, um, are social applications. They allow people to engage with each other on subjects rather than being top-down communications. Most of the platforms that we have in this industry today allow you to communicate to your people, but they allow you to communicate to your people they don't allow your people to communicate with each other. And that's a really important bit. I'll come back to why in a moment. This idea we were just talking about, my daughter's addiction to math suddenly, my addiction to cycling, it's, it's basically built around this premise of habit loops. If you've not come across habit loops before, it's worth, worth investigating. Charles Duhigg wrote a really good book called The Power of Habit, um, which focuses on, on this quite new uh, science around this. But it's, it's, it's the elements that Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram use to hook you to the platforms. There is a trigger, something that, um, that triggers you to go on there. It's normally boredom on your commute in the morning. That's what I find. I'm sitting on the train bored, and so I open up LinkedIn, and I take an action. I, um, 
I might post that I'm coming here for today, for instance, and I get a reward. That reward is somebody liking the fact that I'm coming here today, and I get that nice sort of hit that my friend knows I'm coming here and has liked the comment. Um, and I invest a bit more. I reply back and so on. And then the next thing I know, there's four little red dots in the top-hand corner of the LinkedIn uh, piece that makes me want to log back in again and log back in again and log back in again. If you've got any social app, WhatsApp, LinkedIn, et cetera, you're doing that right now. You're all stuck in habit loops. If you stop at the same McDonald's on the M6, by the way, that's a habit loop. They use this same concept to addict you into to go into the same place and the same place for your coffee every morning, the same Starbucks, the same Costa, whatever it might be. It's a very clever way of addicting people. And if you can addict people, then you've got a high chance of something which we'll come back to in a moment. Personality is another area we're investigating. Um, this is the psychology of people. We tend to have a habit in this industry of doing data analytics based on the data of the humans, um, uh, sorry, data of the people based on demographics. So age, salary, location, gender, et cetera. And we, we think then that personalization can be based off the back of that. That's not how people work. It's based on how people interpret information, how they want to build their own habits and, and the identity that they've shaped before. So if you can start to investigate these areas, you can achieve a lot. And then last thing, well, that leaderboard, the approach of gaining kudos, points, and so on, is gamification. Again, a bit of a buzzword, but it's something that we haven't truly adopted yet. Albeit some here today will we'll talk about that quite readily because it has been embedded in their platforms. When you can do that, you've got the opportunity of achieving a few things. You've got the opportunity of bringing communities together. Community is a much more powerful way of achieving things than the singular. You've got a huge opportunity to look at behavior change. And we'll come back to behavior change in a minute. You've got the opportunity to do, look at true personalization, not the assumed version based on some demographic. And you've got the opportunity to make it playful and fun. If you can make something playful and fun, combined with all of these other aspects, then you get engagement. And if you can get engagement in any singular platform, you can achieve a lot. Most won't change because of one simple reason. We're all being driven to develop technology that returns an investment. And actually the pace and timing of this and the ability to engage people takes some time. And that's why products are rushed to market quickly. It's why people won't necessarily change products fast because again, they're onto a good thing. And there's normally an exit strategy in the future for the privately owned business or a 12 month window for a publicly owned business to show return on investment. It's a really difficult thing to achieve, but we need to be driving that forward as an industry. And I'm here today to talk to my colleagues in the industry about that because it's something that, that has to change. Finally, and just to close off, why is this subject important? You get to do this. If you can achieve all that, you get to engage, create a captive audience of one, of the singular person. That's what people have achieved with the phone. We've got that captive audience, the little red dots that appear create that. If you can achieve that with technology, then the next obvious thing is behavior change. We've all changed our behavior hugely, albeit with shorter attention spans, in the last 10 years because of the technology that's been put in front of us at our fingertips, frictionless, within, uh, within easy reach. And behavior change is really, really key for a couple of reasons coming back to this. For business performance, it changes to annoying tasks becoming simple behaviors. Frictionless, easy, swipes, ups and downs, but at the moment that's not the experience for our people. For HR and reward, it means accurate data. When you've got accurate data and you're not chasing people on admin tasks, you can actually start to become strategic in the thinking that's going on within the organization. You can start to use that data to affect change in the business. That's what we all dream of as HR and reward professionals, has been taking that seriously and been able to drive that change within our organizations. And lastly, on the well-being front, people adopt positive well-being habits and become well. That's the, the utopia, the, the, the thing that's driving me at the moment with product development is how can we actually get people to change their well-being habits, not just throw more mud at the wall in terms of products at them and hoping magically they'll engage with it and suddenly become financially well, physically well, mentally well, socially well. Just putting more stuff in front of people is not going to achieve that. We have to get focused with it. Because if we do it, then the magic elusive words of productivity, then productive as an organization can start to be seen. You can be relevant. You want to be relevant as an employer for the next five years? 
then your tech has to be relevant too. Because the generations that are coming into the workforce right now, not in five years' time, it's right today, are expecting that level of engagement. And we as an industry, I'm talking to my competitors and colleagues in the space, need to, need to recognize that and work with you on it. It allows you to be forward thinking. The tech becomes the simple part. The digital bit becomes the simple part. It allows you to move to a place where you can be strategic. And overall, my personal passion is that if we can do that, we can actually create the healthy workforce of the future. Because at the moment, all we're doing is throwing more mud at the wall and hoping it sticks. If we can create habit change, if we can get people engaged in the technology we put in front of them, anything is possible from a business perspective, from an HR perspective, and even from a well-being perspective, I hope. Thank you very much.